Well, um, we have been in the series about hope and um, talking about what does it mean to have biblical hope? Well, how is that different than worldly hope? And we looked at why we need hope, and I unpacked that over the, the first three weeks. And then we had the wonderful um, Claire Mulrooney, who spoke last week. Yeah, we can give her a whoop. Um, just so blessed by looking at hope in uh, his provision and just love the way that um, Claire spoke into that and that place of surrender as we surrendered to him to be our provider. And if you missed that, uh, you can catch up on our YouTube channel. Um, do watch that. If you missed it, I really encourage you to, to watch that. And as Claire said, over the next number of weeks, we're going to be looking each week on those promises of God that we can put our hope in. And I have uh, a subject here and it is entitled Hope in His Protection. Hope in His Protection. And uh, the way we're going to do this is by looking at a very famous psalm. And it's probably one of the most quoted psalms. You will, uh, you will have ne- heard it, I'm sure. And, um, and it's typically used in a form of a prayer. Many people will pray this psalm because it provides language for us to... Uh, express a desire that we have to be protected by God. And you know, one of the things I spoke about a few weeks ago was the need for us to be real with God about our situation. To, I think I use a phrase, to walk through the pain, don't let the pain walk you. Um, In other words, we need to not just be an optimist by ignoring reality, but saying to God, this is what I'm feeling, this is the reality that I am walking through, and then give that to God. And this psalm allows us to do that. It's also a psalm that I'm sure you've heard, or maybe you've read to someone who is in need of comfort, someone who is in need to feel that the Lord is looking after them. And uh, I know that as a parent, Steph and I have oftentimes quoted uh, this psalm. If that hasn't whetted your appetite, I don't know what will. Are you ready for the psalm? It's Psalm 91. I heard you, there you go. Ah, I knew it was that, Mark. I knew you were going to talk about Psalm 91. Well done. So I'm going to read that. Uh, It's going to be on the screen if you're in the room, and if you're online, it'll be on your device. However, you may want to close your eyes as I read this. Maybe for you, you need that comfort this morning. Maybe for you, you need to hear the promise of protection. And so rather than read it, why don't you just listen to it as I read it to us. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress my God in whom I trust. For he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night nor the arrow that flies by day nor the pestilence that stalks in darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, 10,000 at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only look with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord your dwelling place, the most high who is my refuge. No evil shall be allowed to befall you. No plague come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the adder, the young lion and the serpent you will trample underfoot. Because he holds fast to me in love, I will deliver him. I will protect him because he knows my name. 
When he calls to me, I will answer him. It will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him with long life. I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Amen. That is the word of the Lord. There is so much to unpack in this psalm, so rich in its meaning and so diverse in its application. And I would be lying to you if I didn't say that I struggled much with this psalm this week as I prepared. Um, and I have wrestled with the word as I have sought to try and convey uh, the truth that is in this word because there is much in here that I believe the Lord wants to speak to us this morning. And what I want to do is maybe just track through uh, the psalm with you and, and maybe point out some thoughts that the Lord has given me. And the first thing that struck me as I read this was simply verse one and two. Let's, let's read that again. It says this, he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Now, I don't know about you, but when you think of protection, what do you think about? Maybe you think about your seatbelt when you put on, I hope you put your seatbelts on in the car. Maybe uh, you've got an alarm system with back-to-base monitoring. Maybe that's your protection while you're at home. You know, when we had COVID, everyone was wearing masks, thinking that that would, you know, protect us from germs. There are certain things to give us protection from certain things. And the way we use those things, how many times can I use the word things? Probably a few. When we have those times where we need those things, we grab them and we use them. But I want to say this. When we talk about and we think about the protection of God, it's an altogether type of different thing. It's not something you call upon and put on. It's not something that you use just in the moment. Yes, there are places and there are times for arrow prayers. I love a good arrow prayer. Help! And there's a place for that. But you see, what the psalmist is suggesting here is that there is a different approach to protection when we think about God. Rather than it being a one-off thing, it's about cultivating a lifestyle. And he says it here so well. He says this, he who dwells in the shelter, dwells. What does it mean to dwell? I think it means practicing the presence of God, you know, recognizing that he is with us. You know, this week, um, Ellie, uh, our middle child, um, she was struggling with some night terrors. And uh, as, as recently as last night, uh, she came into, um, into our room and she was, she was scared. And I said, let me come with you, darling. And, and I came with her to her bedroom. And she got into bed. And I just curled up on the end of her bed. And I dwelled with her and she dwelled with me. And the fact that she was dwelling with me, I didn't do anything. I didn't have to do anything. But the fact that she was dwelling with me she, was, she felt protected and she was able to go to sleep. And I think that's a rather beautiful picture of what the psalmist is talking about here. He's saying, he who dwells with God, he who walks with him, he who recognizes that God is with him, that communes with God. You see, the protection that we're talking about here is a result of communion with God, relationship with him. It's about being in prayer. It's about being in his word. It's about recognizing that he sees all things and that he is wanting to be with us. That's what it means to dwell. And I rather think in our present modern day, it is so difficult to dwell. We skip from one thing to the next. We snack on this, that, and the other. But have we lost the art of dwelling? I think I rather have. But what's very interesting about this psalm, you see, is that it moves from he to I. Let me show you what I mean. Verse one is a general statement of trusting God. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. And then verse two says this, I, I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress. 
You see, verse two is a personal testimony. It's easy for us to declare God is a protector, God is almighty, but the question is, is it personal to us? We can know about God, we can declare his character, we can even tell ourselves, we can tell other people, but actually the challenge in this psalm is not do you know that God protects, the challenge in this psalm is this, do you know that he wants to protect you? The challenge in this psalm is not to declare that those that abide with God are protected. The challenge is this, are you abiding with God? You see, as uh, Claire mentioned last week in her talk, when we talk about uh, surrendering to God, it's ultimately about trust. Who do we put our trust in? And I've said it before, I said, uh, that which you put your trust in is ultimately that which you have hope in. You trust in your money, in your bank balance, you have hope that your money will solve your issues. And so fundamentally, the question here is, do you trust God enough that you can surrender to him and dwell with him? And I couldn't even get past past verse one and two in preparing this word before I got unstuck. Because I've seen commentaries on this verse, and I've heard sermons about this verse, and it's all about declaring who God is, and let me just say, we should do that. But where in that is the personal challenge of saying, have you made it personal to you and said that he is? Are you dwelling with God? I think that's the first thing I wanted to highlight. And then let's look on as we read further, we get to verse five, and there's this wonderful two verses that says this, you will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at new day, noonday. I mean, this is quite a comprehensive protection list. Think about it. You know, when you, if you ever meet these, these people that sell you uh, f- alarm systems with back to the base stuff, we don't personally have one, but um, you know, like package one, you've got this. Package two is way more comprehensive. Package three, we'll come round in a van with the dogs. Package four, we'll have a helicopter for you hovering above. You know, package five, we can set some armed guard around your perimeter. You know, package six, and on and on. This is like package 10. This is like the gold package of protection. I mean, what do we see? First thing, we see that it is all the time. What do we see? Terror of night, by day, and just so we're not confused, and noon in the middle. (laughs) I love that. Why is that the case? Well, we read in Psalm 121, I'm going to read this, because this is a very um, similar psalm in many ways. It says this, I lift up my eyes to the hills, from where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. Listen to this. He who keeps you will not slumber. You see, that story I told you about Ellie is a good analogy, but it slightly falls short because I did doze off. (laughs) Two hours later, I woke up and thought, oh, she's asleep, I better go back to bed. (laughs) A little bit cold. But you see, that's not our God. He dwells with us, but he doesn't fall asleep. Like, talk about monitoring. Our God does not slumber. He is actively protecting you. He's actively looking at you. He delights in you. He wants to be with you. Some of you may feel like that no one wants to be with me. I want to tell you right now, this morning, God wants to be with you. Maybe you only came this morning to hear that one thing. God wants to be with you. He wants to lie on the, on the bottom of the bed with you, so to speak, to use that analogy. Because it's a very comprehensive protection plan. What else we see? Second things, it covers all things. We've got fear there, emotion, protection of our emotions. Then we've got physical personal attack, the arrow, that speaks very much of a, of a targeting to you, doesn't it? So we've got, we got emotion, we've got a personal physical attack, then we've got what else? Physical general danger, pestilence. I mean, that covers it, that's quite broad. And then it goes on, what does it say? Destruction that, that wastes as a result of what's around you. I feel like this is a very, in, in packed in two verses, we can see a lot about the heart of God towards us for his protection for us. It's a very comprehensive plan. 
And then let's read on a bit. Verse 11, for he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up lest you strike your foot against the stone. Now, interestingly enough, I'm sure some of you know this. Psalm 91, this point here is actually quoted or probably misquoted by the devil. The only bit of scripture that the devil quotes, when, when does he do that? Well, Jesus is in the, in the desert being tempted. And we read about it in Matthew 4, uh, verses five to six. And Satan quotes this verse and essentially tempts Jesus to say, listen, if you're good, climb up to the top of this temple and jump down and the angels, you know, will, will come to protect you. Now, how does Jesus respond? Deuteronomy 6, 16, Jesus replies, do not put the Lord your God to the test. He's quoting Deuteronomy. Do not put the Lord God to your test. And I think this is a very important point and lesson for us when we talk about the protection of God. You see, the protection we're talking about is a trusted obedience in what God is calling us to. But what it's not is a sinful presumption that God will protect us no matter what we do. And I think this is important. God has given us ways in which we live our lives, not to limit our freedom, but to protect us, whatever that might be. And so oftentimes I meet with Christians and they've come out of God's will. Maybe they've had relations outside of marriage and they've, they've had issues resulted to that. Maybe um, they, they're in a habit of getting drunk. Maybe it's whatever it might be. These things that God says, listen, don't do that. And yet they find themselves out of God's will and they say, why didn't God protect me in that? Now, hear my heart here. I'm not saying that the, by the grace and the love of the Lord, he doesn't come in and save us in spite of ourselves, and I've seen that. But what is Jesus telling us in this? Don't put your Lord God to the test. Don't say, well, God will protect me no matter what. I'll just do it anyway. It's fine. God loves me. We call this hyper grace. You know, it doesn't matter what I do, God will always but I think there's a bit of a stark warning from Jesus here that we can learn from. And so I want, to, I want to encourage you to say, Lord, would you help me? Would you show me by your spirit those things that I'm doing in my life that are outside of your will, that are not dwelling with you, but I'm going contrary to what it means to surrender my will and my obedience to you. And I realize that that comes across as a little bit hard, doesn't it? But if we want to walk in the truth of the word and to walk in the protection of our Lord, I think this is a really important message for all of us this morning. But at this juncture, we've covered a lot here. This is where I got to struggling and wrestling with the word because we've talked about this very comprehensive protection plan. We've talked about how if we dwell with God, of which many here do, we'll be protected. But here is, why don't we address the elephants in the room? Why doesn't that always happen? I could have just preached this and got you excited and energized and, and ignored this fact, but I think we need to ask the question. Because I suspect that just like me, where I've done all this in spite of, and I have had pestilence, or my child has had a disease, or whatever it might be, you say, Lord, help me understand. What does it mean that I, I, I've done all you've asked me to? I, I, I've sought you in prayer. I've worshipped you. I've lived my life in obedience to you as much as I'm able, and yet why does this happen? I'm sure I'm not the only one that has cried out to God and said that same thing. And so I want to look at why that could be the case. And I want to give you some possible reasons. The first one is, this is what you may hear. You don't have enough faith or you're not dwelling enough. There are certain streams that would suggest that if you're not walking in the promises of God to its entirety, it's down to your lack of faith. I have 
being part of churches where that was the message and someone would say, why am I still sick? I pray to God. I believe that God can, can heal me. And the, and, the, and the person said, well, it's because you lack faith. And that's just been a body blow. Now, I don't want to undermine the importance of faith. We know that in Jesus' hometown, he wasn't able to do anything because they lacked faith. I'm not talking about the fact that faith isn't important. Absolutely is. What I'm telling you here is that is not always the reason why we don't see this fulfilled in our lives. So it's not necessarily that. And some of you are probably in some of these pestilences or some of these issues, and you're just, and you've had faith, and you haven't been outside of the Lord's will. Number two, this is another way in which some people will help manage that tension by saying this, it isn't a real promise of God. That the psalm is just a poetic desire, and it's poetry, and you need to read it with that lens, so you can't claim this as a promise of God. I disagree. Yes, it's poetry, and it's beautiful, isn't it? Yes, it gives us language to express our desire, but... (laughs) Here's the thing of it. Does it express the character of God that you know and love? Yes. And so this is a promise of God. So, okay, Mark, if it's not because I don't have enough faith, although faith is important, and if it's not because um, these aren't real promises, something else must be going on here, absolutely. And in order to understand this, we need to understand it through the lens of his kingdom breaking in and the tension of the here and the not yet. What do I mean by that? The Lord's Prayer, Lord, would your kingdom come here on earth as it is in heaven? Now, Jesus, when he came, he he proclaimed that the kingdom of God is at hand. It is near, right? And when he died on the cross, and if you've been here for any length of time, you would have heard me speak about this before. When he died on the cross, he inaugurated his kingdom, okay? That was the decisive blow to the enemy. And I've used the analogy before, it's like D-Day and V-Day. That was the D-Day. That was it. There was, the, the, the battle had been won, but the, the, the battle had to play out until we got to V-Day, Victory Day. And that is when Jesus comes again. And that is when his rule and his reign is established here. But until that time, we pray, Lord, will your will be done on earth as it's in heaven? There are other wills at stake here, uh, in play here. There's the devil's will. There's our will. There's the world's will. We're, we're not in that place yet of the fully consummated kingdom. But you see, we live in this tension that we see his kingdom breaking in. We have those those moments where we see miracles of healing. We see those miracles that come through. And sometimes we don't. And as painful as it it is, we live in that tension point. You hear me? And that's why we see and we grapple with this struggle. So what does that mean, Mark? Because you're talking about hope here and all of a sudden I feel like, well, what's the point? That's a fair question. I get you. What I would say to this is this, we're called to live in the here, not the not yet bit. Sorry, I'll say that the other way around, shall we? Thank you. Well done for pointing that out. We're here to live in the not yet bit, not the here bit. In other words, we're here to declare the kingdom, to embrace the kingdom, and to seek his kingdom. Because what's therefore the point of praying the Lord's Prayer? And I bet you pray the Lord's Prayer sometimes. Our desire is to see his kingdom come. And I would propose that A lot of the issue is, is that we camp in the here bit and we don't embrace the not yet bit. I've seen it in my life. It normally goes like this. Well, what's the point? What's the point? You know, Wimber, when uh, people used to come to him and say, uh, John Wimber, the founder of Vineyard, say, listen, I've prayed for people. I'm not seeing them healing, healed. He said, listen, go pray for 5,000, then come back and tell me. Could have been a number higher or lower. But the point here is that we give up so quickly. But we can place our hope that he loves us and that that are his promises. And we've got to stand on those promises. We declare those promises. We seek those promises. And I suspect that in my life, I will see more breakthrough if I push into the not yet and embrace his kingdom coming than if I just give up and say, well, what's the point? Because that's the option we've got. 
But you see, there is hope in God. And I want to encourage you this morning to fix your eyes on God and say, listen, number one, I recognize that my protection from the Lord comes out of a place of dwelling with him. And for me, that is where it starts, a personal challenge to put my trust in him, to surrender in him, and to dwell with him. And maybe for you, your question this week is, Lord God, can you just show me, what does it mean to dwell with you? Simple. What does it mean to dwell with you? Number two, it's about then taking that as a personal testimony and saying, I'm not just to declare who God is, I'm going to declare that he is my God and I'm going to walk in that. Number three, it's about saying and recognizing that God's heart towards us is to protect us from all things. And number four, do a bit of an audit in your life. How do you do this? You say, Holy Spirit, would you come and convict me of all those things in my life that are not right with you, that are contrary to your will? You see, if you're praying the Lord's Prayer, Lord, your kingdom come, your, earth be do- um, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, it has to start with you first. That prayer has to start with praying it for yourself. You're not just saying, oh man, that world's crazy. I wish they would do your will. And yet we go on sinning in different areas. That doesn't make any sense. The challenge here is to pray the Lord's Prayer in our life and say, Lord, would you show me uh, those areas that I'm not in your will? And lastly, I want to say this. As kingdom people, we have been called to extend God's kingdom in faith. And so we need to push in. And I often will pray this as a prayer. As I said, Steph and I before have prayed this over our children. It's a challenge for us to do it more. But why don't you take this psalm and use it as your daily prayer and claim it for yourself. Lord, thank you that your word says that you will protect me during the day. Thank you, Lord God, that your promise towards me is that you'll protect me from pestilence. Thank you, God. So turn that promise into a prayer for your life. And I, and I guarantee you'll see, I guarantee you will start seeing God move in ways you have yet to see. And lastly, I would say this. I know there'd be many times where God's protected me, which I won't even know about until I get to heaven. I mean, I remember this one occasion. I do remember this time. It was about 25 years ago. And uh, I was in London with some friends after work, having a drink at a bar. And I had to go to the cash machine to get some more cash for whatever reason. I came out. There was a park part van here and I just stepped out and I went to do this and literally as if someone held me back and in that moment this bus just went right by and I was like oh my word I think an angel just protected me from that I suspect there are many 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 occasions in your life where you look back and God has saved you in that moment and so I've just been encouraged to say you know what thank you Lord that you protect me Thank you that you've protected me from myself. Thank you for protecting me from the world. Thank you, Lord, for, for, the, for the way in which you protected me from other. Like, God is there actively working. But either A, we don't cr- give credit to it because we're still disappointed about other stuff, or B, we don't take the time to recognize it. But thank you, Lord, that you're my protector. And as we thank him, out of that lifestyle of thankfulness, our hope builds Our hope builds in God to be our protector. I'd like us all to stand, if that's okay.